try Jesus, not me, cause I throw hands, try Jesus, please don't try me, because I fight. getting slapped but if you touch me or mine we gonna have to scrap so try Jesus please don't try me cause I fight I have no problem laying these heads try Jesus don't try me Cause I throw hands Try Jesus Please don't try me Because I fight I know he said Turn the other cheek But that's just one part of the Bible that don't sit right with me, so. so try Jesus, please don't try me, because I fight, I have no problem laying these ends. So try Jesus, <laughs> not me, because I throw hands. <laughs> This message is one of the hardest messages of Jesus because he challenges us in Luke chapter 6, verse 27 to 29, to love our enemies. Three very hard words, three very misunderstood words, three words that challenge us to elevate the very people that may have broken us, bruised us, hurt us, or harmed us. Uh, when Jesus taught this he was flying at a whole different level. It was in a completely different moral ethic he was elevating. He was not just spinning out what had been taught in years gone by. He was soaring into the stratosphere a champion, championing a moral love ethic that was unlike anyone or anything that had been heard to that day. Elevate your enemies. How? How do you elevate your enemies? We use as an illustration and it's so illustrated well in this song that when someone slaps you on one cheek, offer them the other. Turn the other cheek. Turn the other cheek. Verse 29. Now those are hard words, aren't they? Those are the very same words that cause sometimes for people to allow hurtful people to keep hurting them because they think, well, you know, I got to turn the other cheek. It's the same words that sometimes oppressors have used to continue to oppress people. Because they'll say, well, you got to turn the other cheek, right? Turn the other cheek. But it's funny, those words, love your enemies, are the very three words I always go to when someone characterizes the Christian faith as being for weak people, someone that needs help, or someone needs support. Okay, we're all friends here, right? Got a great crowd here this morning. If you haven't come out to one of our physical gatherings, you might want to join us next Sunday. Go to One Church TO. You've got to register there. But he, here, here's the thing. Uh, when it comes to loving our enemies and what that actually means and how we actually do it, we need to realize that. Uh, and if it, I, I said I'd go there all the time because uh, if people characterize the Christian faith as for weak or helpless people, or if, here's the facts. Let's talk real talk. Facts. Everyone is weak. Facts. Everybody needs help. Facts. Someday, everyone will need support. And I'm so thankful that Jesus provides that level of help, support for those who know they're weak and they can experience his strength by his spirit and through the redemptive community called the church. But, but make no mistake about it. Is it easy to follow Jesus? Nope. Is it easy to forgive and love your enemies? Nope. But is it important? It's critically important, actually. 
In fact, understanding the gospel appropriately is attached to this command of Jesus, love your enemies. And it really is a command in scripture to love your enemies. There's this great theologian, his name's Miroslav Wolf, and he wrote a lot of books on forgiveness. And he said this, I love this quote. He said, if you take love your enemy out of Christianity, you've unchristian the Christian faith. Love your enemy is at the core of the gospel. Why? Because it's an acknowledgement that you and I, we were all enemies of God. We were all enemies of God. And God demonstrated his love for us by sending his son to reconcile us back into relationship with himself. So this is a key teaching. But how do you do it? This is a really misunderstood portion of scripture. So I want to break it down. Love your enemies can be understood. And let's, let's just parse it out a little bit. In that little command, love your enemies, is a truth. And the truth is simply this. We all have enemies. We all have enemies. Jesus has enemies. I have enemies. You have enemies. Now, you might be one of those extrovert, hug it out type persons, and you're going like, enemy? That's a bit of a dramatic term. I don't have anyone chasing me with a knife. But Jesus helps us understand the nuance of what he means by enemies, by even that illustration of if somebody slaps you on the cheek, turn the other cheek. See, a slap, was an insult. And, you know, it's no different than in our culture today. I, I have a, a son who loves mixed martial arts. And it's funny, you know, when I, I don't understand a lot about it, to be honest with you. But I know this, no instructor is sending their student into the ring to fight and say, hey, slap them across the face. <laughs> and no, you're going to punch them. You're going to do something different in this sport to make, to win your points or to win the match. And a slap was an insult in Jesus' day, and it is in our day. It wasn't so much a physical assault he's talking about. He's talking about an assault on your honor. An assault on your honor. It's a personal insult. It's a personal offense we've experienced. So when you think of it that way, we all have enemies, don't we? We've all had enemies. Can I even go a little bit further? We've all been enemies. Have you ever insulted someone? personally offended someone? Have you ever uh, uh, maybe even taken a run at their honor? Have you ever had that happen to you? Well, then you're qualified for this, this teaching. When he says, turn the other cheek, Jesus is inviting us into something completely radical, completely radical. See, for the followers of Jesus, this is an ethic he calls us into that might be very different than the world around us. So the ethic goes like this. For the follower of Jesus, we're very concerned about injustice, both in this world and happening to us. And I'm going to show you how we respond in just a moment. We're very concerned. But here's the thing we're not concerned about. We're not concerned about saving face. We're not concerned about our own ego. We're not concerned about our own image. The more we hold on to saving face, image, and ego the less likely we are actually going to be able to practice loving your enemies. You're going to see by the end of this message, there's a whole lot of humility needed to properly love your enemies as Jesus asks us to. But let's explore what it means to be mistreated in this life. Because I know there's varying degrees of mistreatment. Some of you, maybe online or in this room, you've been mistreated in a way that was very damaging. Others of us, there's a pattern of somebody in our life that just has a way of maybe just harming or hurting us. And those are enemies as Jesus would define them. It's both the, the, the deep, dark, difficult ones and it's also just the, the pattern ones. And we all respond differently to mistreatment. Uh, the one way that often people respond is a passive response. A passive response. There are people, and maybe you count yourself among them, that when someone hits you, you just keep turning the other cheek and let them keep hitting you. Uh, you're, you. You let people mistreat you. You don't want to confront them. You don't want to challenge them. I get it. You don't want to complain. You don't want to speak up. You don't want to rebuke them. And so what happens is you're involved in that painful dance of being hit, 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 hit. You take the abuse. You take the mistreatment. You just swallow it. You just swallow it. You don't want to rock the boat. Here's a question, though, I have for you. If that's you, 
If you're one of those people and you know when someone comes at you, you have more of a passive response. Here's a question I want you to think about today. The question is simply this. Is it really loving to let others do unloving things to you? Think about that for a minute. Is it loving to let other people do unloving things to you? There's two sides to that coin. How about yourself? Uh, You know, loving yourself is a important part of understanding God's creative work in your life. It's a hard part for many of us. But is it loving to let someone take runs at you, disrespect you, knock you down over and over? And then on the other side, is it loving to the other person to let them do this? Is it loving to allow someone to behave in a way that's counter Jesus' kingdom? Is that a loving thing? So, listen... Jesus can't possibly mean become a doormat when he says turn the other cheek. Just become a doormat. Just let people do whatever they want to you. That can't possibly be what Jesus is teaching because it's unloving to allow people to act in unloving ways towards you. And you'll see in a minute, even towards others. That's not loving. So some people have a passive response Some people have, and you know, psychologists will say this. I I think it's fascinating because it's kind of played out in scripture too. That a lot of people act passively because the pain of maintaining the status quo is less than the pain of having to confront someone. So they'll just maintain the status quo. Consequently, marriages, relationships, friendships will sometimes stay with this underlining hostility that's in place because one person is so passive, they don't want to deal with it. And so the other person has their way. Now, the other response to mistreatment is not sometimes passive. Some of us are aggressive. When we feel mistreated, we get aggressive. We pay them back. We get vindictive or vengeful. Where does that come from? Well, sometimes it's a learned behavior. Sometimes it's our temperament. Some of our personalities are more quick and accelerated than other people's personalities. You know what I've noticed over the years? Sometimes with aggression, with mistreatment, a lot of it is done because it works. When someone powers up, most of the passive people around them give them what they want, right? That's normally the rhythm, how it works. So there's a pattern to it. They do it because it works, right? Now, some of us, we're even more creative. We're not passive or aggressive. We're both. You ever been there? We're both, (laughs) This is the type of person that they get mistreated, they take hits, 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 and they never react, and one day they explode. They explode, and everyone around them is like, where did that come from? Or the news media is next door to their house saying, I've known my neighbor all these years. He's such a nice guy. I can't believe he did that. It was because they buried and buried and buried and buried the abuse until it couldn't be contained anymore. Some people... Some people, they're passive on the outside, but inside, they're burning with fury. And it comes out in passive-aggressive ways that they deal with other people. Here's what Jesus is saying when he's calling us to love our enemies in the face of mistreatment. He's saying that none of those reactions are healthy. In fact, they contribute to the misery we already see in this world. They just further contribute to it. And he calls followers of Jesus to a higher level, a different ethic, a different way. Understand it this way. For the Christian, the follower of Jesus, we're to be active on the outside in resolving injustice and walking toward issues of justice. We have a little saying on our staff, you you have to be active, walk towards the mess on the outside, but they're at peace on the inside. Many people, it's the inverse of that. They don't do anything about it, but they're at war inside. And they never live in places of peace. The Christian way is to be at peace with God and peace on the inside, but to actively deal with issues that are injustice issues. So inside, we're forgiving and we're warm. Outside, we're actively pursuing justice. We're confronting injustices in this world. So here's what we learned so far. We all have enemies. I don't know if you need to come here today to to learn that. But here it is. It's not necessarily characterized as that aggressive person that's just gunning to get you. It's sometimes a family member. Sometimes it's someone that we even live with. Sometimes it's someone we're in relationship with. 
and they needle, 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 or they, they point, 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 or you know how, you know when you know people really well, they can press your buttons? Come on, I bet you do it sometimes. We all do it. I mean, it's part of being with humans, right? And after a while, they become in this category where we feel not only dishonored, but maybe just wounded even. So what do we do about it? Well, Jesus, this is what I love about Jesus. Jesus never asks us to do something that we aren't able to do. And so we know this. If Jesus taught us to love our enemies, which was a command, then we must be able to do it. And you'll see in a minute, it's difficult though. We must be able to do it. Here's the next thing, is we don't have to be perfect to do it because Jesus also taught us to pray daily to forgive us of our trespass. He knew we would never do this perfectly. So we need lots of grace, don't we, friends? We all need grace along the journey. And here's the beautiful part. If you're a follower of Jesus, his spirit is inside of you. So you don't do it alone. You don't have to love your enemies alone. You have the Holy Spirit convicting, guiding, encouraging, coaching you through this. So we're not alone in this. So here's the thing. We can all learn to love our enemies. How do we do that? Well, when Jesus taught in Luke chapter 6, I'm, I'm focusing on 27 to 29. If you get a chance to read the scriptures around it, he asks a lot of us. It's a fascinating text. But you need to understand what Jesus is teaching is really an extension of the Old Testament and some of the teachings there. Because in the Old Testament, followers of God were to hold two things in balance. They were to do justice and love kindness. Some of you who already know what verse I'm going to go to. The prophet Micah in chapter 6, verse 8, he says this, and I love the opening words. What does the Lord require of you? Isn't that good to know? Isn't it good to know what God requires of you? Here it is. But to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Here's the thing in the bulk of scripture and how it's handled is there's a balancing act to be had. We're to do justice, but to love kindness. Here's another way to put it. In modern terms that'll help you when you think of relationships, we're to be both tough and tender. Now, some of us are naturally tough, and we have to work on the tender. Some of you are ooey-gooey tender, but you're not tough enough to love your enemies because it requires toughness and tenderness to love your enemies. It requires justice and kindness to love your enemies, and it's not easy to do, but that's the balance of following Jesus and how we love our enemies. Now, we're in this moment uh, globally right now where we're seeing the scales of justice trying to get recalibrated in more fairness, whether it's racially or whether it's gender equality or even economical disparity and how do we make this a fairer world? And it will never be done perfectly for sure. But as Christians, this should get us excited. Anytime we see people who've lacked justice find some justice, whew, that should get us excited. To be a part of helping people find justice, that should get us motivated. Why? Because we're people who do justice. But here's the thing, because you're a follower of Jesus, when you do justice or speak up about justice, it's without any venom. It's without venom then. This is not easy. Now, Job is an interesting character in the Old Testament. If not Job, Job. And Job in the Old Testament is the oldest written book in the Bible. And it's a story of a man, many of you would know the story, and in the 29th chapter, he's reflecting on the fact that he's suffering a lot in life. And if you ever want to know more about Job, go into our teaching archive. Pastor Keith Smith did a great month-long series on the book of Job last summer. I think it was last J July. But in Job chapter 29, Job is reflecting on why is he suffering so much in this life. And he says this, I rescued the poor who cried for help, and the fatherless who had none to assist them. Justice was my robe and my turban. I was eyes to the blind and feet to the lame. I was a father to the needy. I looked, uh, I looked at the case of the stranger and the immigrant. I broke the fangs of the wicked and snatched the victims from their teeth. Job mentions a widow, single mom, father, fatherless children, uh, those who are disadvantaged, 
He mentions the immigrant or the refugee. He mentions the blind and the lame. What do all those people have in common? They don't have clout. They don't have power. And so in Job's day, maybe a little bit sometimes like today, there are systems that were set up to take advantage of those very people. And Job knew the Old Testament narrative really well. It's interesting when you read through Scripture as if it's a full narrative, not just individual verses here, but a full narrative, you begin to see that there's this common thread that Job understands. Job understands that whether you're male or female, whether you're a widow or, or in a, a marriage, whether you come from the right family or the wrong family, whether you're young or old or rich or poor, there's this, there's this word that emanates throughout Scripture, and it's this, respect. Respect what? Respect the fact that every human being is made in the image of God. That the fingerprints of God are pressed on their lives. So Job looks around. And he sees them being taken advantage of, and he goes to bat for them. And did you pick up that last verse from chapter 29 that I read? He says this, I broke the fangs of the wicked and snatched them from the victims of their teeth. Now, think about that. Does that sound like turn the other cheek? Does that sound kind of wimpy or passive? Well, no, he's doing justice, doing justice. See, he understands that everyone is sacred. And everyone deserves justice. And so even when we are being mistreated, justice is a very important narrative. But if you do justice without kindness, you'll never do it right. If you do kindness without justice, it's very unloving. So how do we do this? When he says they broke their fangs, how does he do it in a, in a way that's right? Well, when Jesus says love your enemies, he goes on to say this, pray for those who mistreat you. Not easy, is it? Pray for those who mistreat you. Then he says, you know, of course, if someone slaps you on one cheek, present the other cheek to them also. What is he saying here? Here's what he's saying. Here's the boiling down the message. He's saying this. When someone insults you, harms you, offends you, when someone takes a run at you, when someone turns on you, you need to turn the other cheek. And turning the other cheek is redefining the relationship. It's redefining the relationship. It's starting over because if you allow them to keep doing it, you're either tipping the scales all towards kindness and you become so passive, you're letting them, and it's not very loving to do that, or you're going to tip the scales to justice and you're going to go right after them, and, but you won't have kindness and that won't be a very loving response either. You need to redefine the relationship between toughness and tenderness, justice and kindness, it's redefining it. Now, I got to tell you, at this point in the message, I know we need a little bit of a pump-up moment because this is hard. Can, can you say hard? You know, maybe just elbow the person next to you if you got someone next to you because we're doing social distancing, but you came with them, so that's okay. You can elbow them and say, uh, this is hard. This is hard. This is not easy to do. It requires that four-letter word, W-O-R-K, work. This is not glamorous and it's not easy. So I saw this little video online and I thought, I got to show you this because the indomitable spirit of this young boy on the basketball court as he talks about work and what it means, I want to help you channel that when it comes to loving your enemies. Let's watch this little video. Eat up. You work hard for it or you don't work hard for it? Well, me and my brother, we work hard for our stuff. It don't come easy. In life, you have to work. Either we want to be the shark of the ocean or the fish of the ocean. And right now, we want to be the shark. Take over everything. Strength, no weakness. Power, the muscle. Have to have that mindset. So you're going to come in here and dominate. What do you say? Oh. No, no, no. Don't put yourself down. Motivate yourself. Keep yourself up, pumped, and ready for any challenge. Okay, infectious or what? I mean, that kid's going places. Something's going to happen through that kid. But I love some of the things he was saying because, you know, one of the great gifts my dad gave me was the instilling the value of a good work ethic. Uh, nothing comes easy. 
And easy gives nothing. Nothing comes easy, easy gives nothing. There's some things in life that don't just happen, we work for them. And loving your enemies is one of those things. And didn't you love how we said, you're either the shark or the fish in the ocean? <laughs> and I'm the shark, muscle strength. I loved his, you know, little scrawny arms, and, but he's muscled up from the inside out. He's feeling that passion and strength. See, the world would say this, when your enemies come at you and mistreat you, you become the shark and the predator and crush them. And Jesus is very different. Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. Turn the shark on that part of you that wants to hit them back. Turn that shark on the part of you that won't step up and say anything. We need to find a strength, and this is why we need supernatural help in order to love our enemies. It's not natural in our human broken state to love our enemies. We need a supernatural strength. So there's two ways that you get footing when you love your enemies. Now, uh, let me illustrate this. A number of years ago, in another church in a distant galaxy, far, 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 far away. <laughs> I, I, I've shared part of the story. I never shared full story, but there was a man in my office. And he was very angry, very angry at me, very angry at the church, very angry in general. This is about the third time you've been in my office, very angry. And guys, I'm not this good. This must have been just the Holy Spirit was there helping me in this divine moment. But this guy's raising his voice. He's getting more and more aggressive, aggressive. And finally, I had to say, Rick, that's not his real name, uh, Rick, I think this conversation is going to have to end. I'm going to have to ask you to leave. I want a relationship with you. I care deeply about you. But if this doesn't change, then we're, we're, we've got to stop this conversation. So I'm going to ask you to leave, and maybe we can pick it up later because we need something to change in this narrative. Now, think about that. Does that feel or sound loving? It's hard, right? Is it loving, though, to have allowed him to continue to hit me, hit me, hit me? There's already a pattern here. This is the third time I met with this guy. Third time, the same thing. It would be very unloving for me to do that. It would have been easier for my personality, though, to be honest, to do that. My personality would be more like, just take it, Jonathan. Just take it. Just take it. But it was unloving to continue to allow that to happen. Because you know what's going to happen? He'll do that to his spouse at home. He'll start to do that to other people. Why? It gets results. Here's the other part. I could have given him a dose of his own medicine, couldn't I? I could have said, listen, pal, blankety blank, 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 blank. Would that be loving? That'd be extremely unloving. That would not be a good way to respond. So how do you respond in these moments? Well, you turn the other cheek. And here's what Jesus is driving at when he says turn the other cheek. We've often thought that turning the other cheek was to allow someone to slap us on the other cheek. It's interesting as theologians unpack what Jesus meant in that moment, that turning the other cheek actually meant giving them the opportunity to kiss the cheek instead of slap the other cheek. In other words, how can we bridge the gap between our enemies and us? So I'm going to give you two words that are critically important. Actually, it's three words, but two points. The first one is forgive. Jesus calls us to forgive our enemies. Tough to do. But if you don't forgive, injustice has won. If you don't forgive, injustice has beaten you. If you don't forgive, it's very difficult to go to God and ask for his forgiveness because we know what it means to be enemies of God. We know what it means to be in the wrong standing and we don't have the right standing dependent on God's grace. So forgiveness is one. The next one is a little trickier. It, I call it dynamic boundaries. You need to set dynamic boundaries. If you're going to allow a person to keep taking runs at you, there, you need boundaries. Some of us don't have boundaries around people that are harmful in our life, and you need boundaries. But some of us, depending on your personality, if you love justice, you set hard boundaries. Hard boundaries aren't helpful. Because what if your enemy recognizes, matures, gets healthy, and recognizes they've done something wrong here. Well, if you set a hard boundary, that can never be bridged again. A dynamic boundary can move. This is important because a dynamic boundary needs to be able to move. So in other words, somebody's hurt you. Someone's harming you. They're, they're, they're involved in a pattern uh, that might be destructive towards you. You need to set a boundary. 
Now, if you set the boundary too close to yourself and they come with double aggression, you need a dynamic boundary that you can push further away. At the same time, if they show a, 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 a contrite heart and they, they approach and they recognize what they've done, you need to be able to move that boundary closer to you then. Boundaries are critical to keep you safe in order that you can properly love your enemies. Now, how do you set boundaries? How do you forgive? This Wednesday, 7 o'clock at One Church Teal Live, I'm going to be live streaming with Jerry Sen, one of our directional leaders, and I'm going to show you that in order to set good boundaries, I'll show you how to do it, you need to be able to discern what type of enemy you're dealing with. Because the type of enemy, scripturally, that you deal with requires a different type of boundary. So I'm going to talk to you about what type of boundary you need to set for what type of enemy you might be dealing with in life, right now, or maybe in the future. And then how do you forgive someone that's hurt you, harmed you? If forgiveness is key, how do you do it? Now, that's Wednesday, 7 o'clock. That's really important. But I want to give you something before you leave here to chew on on your way home on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and then Wednesday we'll unpack it because there will be a live stream. You can ask questions and I'll do my best to answer it. See, in Micah chapter 6 verse 8, it says to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Humility is the key to loving your enemies and humility is the key to having healthy relationships. In our first gathering, I noticed in the chat room, someone was telling a story about a neighbor they had a major conflict with. And this, this person was aggressive towards this, this person. And yet, uh, this, I, I don't even know who the person is. They had some sort of name in the chat room. But they said, they said that they kind of exaggerated what they had done in order to get them into trouble. And they realized they had done the wrong thing. And they asked forgiveness. They said the hardest thing they did was walk across the hallway and ask forgiveness of their neighbor, this person who had been aggressive with them. And I thought, man, isn't it amazing how the pathway of humility opens up the possibility of a relationship that could be healed? Now, without proper boundaries, it can be dangerous. Forgiveness is not forgetting. Forgiveness is not even reconciling. Those are further steps further down the line. But forgiveness is critical. And here, the proper boundaries keep us safe. What we need is humility. Humility in our marriages. Humility in our parenting. Humility in our friendships. Humility in our church life. All of a sudden, we're choosing trust over suspicion. All of a sudden, we're looking for the good instead of looking for the wrong. Humility means I know who I am. I know I can contribute to the messes around here too. And I'm not looking to point fingers as much as examine my own heart. So I was thinking about it this week, and I was thinking that it's kind of like getting bruised in life. Enemies can be a gift. I know you don't want to hear that. And especially if someone's really hurt you or harmed you in life. And we'll be praying for healing for you at the end of our gathering. But, but enemies can be a gift in as much as this. Every one of us will be bruised in this life. It's unavoidable. Don't be shocked by it. Don't be naive. You're going to be bruised. You're even going to be bruised by good people, people that you're a little surprised by. But a bruise can do one of two things. A bruise can ripen a fruit or it can spoil a fruit. Uh, sometimes I'll get orange. I love oranges. I love citric, citric fruits. And I'll roll them. You ever do that? Roll them on the counter and you get them really soft? What you're doing is bruising them. But what you're doing is ripening it so it's even better and more juicy. But if I drop it and I put it back in the bowl like an apple and I leave it there, that bruise will spoil over time. And so it is when we're bruised by our enemies in life. Deal with it quickly. And it can ripen and mature you into a deeper love that Jesus has for you. A different type of radical love ethic. If you don't deal with it, it will spoil and that's why a lot of us limp along in marriages and relationships and other things with so many things unresolved because we become, in the spoiledness, we become either too aggressive or too passive or too passive-aggressive. Either way, we're not living that Christ-like life, peaceful on the inside, active on the outside. You know how you can do that? Well, we're going to talk about it on Wednesday night, but we're going to pray right now. And here's one thing we're going to do. I'm going to pray for healing 
Because I know part of forgiveness and part of establishing good boundaries is us being more whole ourselves. But also too, what if we did, took the brave step, just a brave step forward to love our enemies and bless them and pray for them today? Sound like a plan? Sounds like a Jesus plan. Let's pray. Well, Father, you've heard the content of our conversation. And God, I am so thankful that you didn't sugarcoat things or spoon feed us. You led us to truth and truth sets us free. And elevating our enemies seems so counterintuitive to our woundedness, our brokenness, and the way our world operates. So friends, God, I just pray for my friends here in this room and online, everyone who's been wounded, harmed, hurt, maybe in not just surface ways, maybe not just in little offenses or insults, but very, very deeply. God, I would never minimize that, and I know you don't, but I know what you're capable of, Jesus. I pray you would invade whatever brokenness or pain or hurt that is there with your healing power. And God, do you give the courage for some of us to take a next step into maybe even counseling or whatever is needed to help find healing and resolution there. And God, I pray too for my friends here who are in present situations and it's real time. And this talk is a little too close to comfort because they're in real time conversations like this. God, I pray for real discernment and wisdom to establish healthy boundaries. And God, the ability to forgive which is a process that you begin to lead people to forgive others just as you have forgiven us. And in turn, and friends, I'd invite you to, if people have come to mind during this message, just people that have maybe been like enemies, and maybe you wouldn't even call them that, but you know, as Jesus defines it, you realize, yeah, that's them. I'd invite you to bring them to mind because we're going to bless them now. Father, we pray for those who persecute us. We bless those who persecute us. And God, we pray that every one of our enemies would take a step into relationship with you. We know if they know you, that is the greatest healing balm on this earth. Hurting people often hurt people. God, we recognize that there's brokenness in them. Help us to establish boundaries so we don't let their brokenness break us. But at the same time, we bless them today and we pray that you would lead them closer to your son, Jesus. We ask all of this in the powerful, majestic, awesome name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen, amen.